Hello everybody, welcome to today's webinar, Putting the Profilometer to Work. I am Amanda Harmoning, I am an admin assistant here at AERA, and I will be helping moderate today's event with my colleague, Rob Monroe. Hey everyone, yeah, Rob Monroe here. I look after membership and technical development with AERA. And a couple of slides to go through here real quick before we bring Lake on, uh, just a couple little housekeeping items to get to, to go through. If you haven't checked this out already, uh, our tech, Steve Fox and Chuck Lynch, they host the Engine Professional Podcast. So you can strictly go to this web address right here to log on to the podcast. Uh, they just finished doing episode number six. So number six was uh, all about torque yield head bolts in today's engines. They brought on uh, one of the guest speakers that we had was Brian Roberts, who's another tech at AERA. And Brian has 20 years of, uh, in, of industry experience with the gasket company. So a lot of good information there in that Engine Professional podcast. I'd encourage you to go on and check that out. And something else that we've got right now, you probably were getting this just in your mailbox as we speak. The first quarter of Engine Professional is out there now. So there's lots of good information in there. Uh, if you want to receive that digitally, I mean, all you have to do is just log on to www.engineprofessional.com and you can uh, read a copy of that magazine. Lots of good stuff for the shop in there. I mean, we have Lake on. I mean, he does some uh, guest writing for us and does articles. And the idea of Engine Professional is so that you can literally take any of these articles right into the shop and, uh, and apply them. So really good hands-on stuff to, to learn there. For those of you that are on today as well, if, if you're not receiving Engine Professional and you'd like a copy, just go over to that questions box and just put in there that you'd like to receive a copy. And Amanda will then get your contact information and address from you and we'll get that mailed off to you. So something to watch out for there. And uh, like I say, that's we're there to help you with that. Another thing for those of you that are members of AERA or would like to be members of AERA, there's five of us on the tech line. Uh, that work Monday through Friday. We're 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Lots of good information that we have. And I just wanted to mention too that over 50% of our calls now are diesel related. So, you know, you can sort of see the shift in industry just a little bit. And it was some of the stuff that are, is going through the shops. And a lot of our shops are working on lots of diesel stuff. So we've uh, armed ourselves with lots of resources. We have lots of good information in our library to help you with the diesel stuff, you know, injection pump timing. Um, you know, even in, on the automotive side, if you're working on your car and you, you need something as, you know, like maybe a, a ball joint re and re procedure, we can help you with any of that kind of stuff as well. So do take advantage of the tech line. You're far better off letting us look after all that stuff for you and, and gather that information than uh, spending the time yourself coming off the shop floor to do that. So take advantage of that. We're, we're there to help you. Something that we're really excited about for 2021. Uh, we just finished up our AERA balancing manual. So this is just over 100 pages, lots of good stuff in there. There's uh, balancing theory, setting up bob weights. There's lots of really good color photos in the balancing manual. Uh, so if you're an AERA member, you're going to receive that balancing manual as part of our annual mailing. That'll be there. Uh, so look for that in your mailbox. That'll be coming your way here pretty quick. Uh, if you're not a member, you can purchase this manual. So um, I mean, this is just one of those great reasons to be a member of AERA is because we can supply you with this kind of information. So very excited about it. Um, there's not another manual like this out there. Balancing is kind of one of those things that there's just not a ton of information or literature printed. So very excited that the techs could uh, help put this together as well as we had Mike Maverigan and lots of help from Randy Neal at CWT Industries with this one. So uh, very thankful for that and glad that we've got that manual out there for everybody. So. All right, well, let's, uh, enough of me talking. Let's get on with Lake Speed Jr. Let's, let's bring Lake on. Now, Lake is from Total Seal Piston Rings, and a lot of you recognize Lake. I mean, he is a, a huge, huge force in our industry, and uh, he just finished hosting the Engine Professional Expo. And, uh, I mean, he's truly a leader in training and education for us. And, like I say, we're lucky to have him and his dedication to engine building and what he does for us. So, all right. Well, Lake, uh, how you doing today? I know it's super chilly where I am. I'm not how you, you know, well, how things are with you, but we're we're down in the minuses, so we're freezing uh, up here. Uh, it's terrible. It's terrible, yeah. Rob. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm in North Carolina, so I, I'm obviously working for Total Seal, and Total Seal being based in Phoenix, Arizona, I do spend uh, quite a bit of time in Arizona, so uh, I do envy that Arizona winter weather right about now. It's uh, here if you're North Carolina, you know it's nowhere near minuses, but it's yeah, it's not a 
pretty day, but you know, sorry. <laughs> can't right. have everything, can you, all the time? No, exactly. Well, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you get on with today's presentation. And if, like okay. I say, if anybody has any questions for Lake, Amanda and I are in the background and we'll, uh, we'll get those in and over to Lake at the end. And Lake, I'll let you go at her. Boom. There you go. So everybody should be able to see uh, the presentation. So, okay. So what we're going to do today is to, you know, talk about the profilometer, uh, which is one of my favorite tools, by the way. And I have to thank, uh, give a little shout out to my good buddy, uh, Billy Godbold at CompCams. He's the guy that introduced me to this tool. Uh, let me use the one he had there, or he has there at CompCams. They use um, in the QC department and it quickly became one of my favorite tools to use and so I'm pretty excited about uh, being able to talk more about uh, this tool today and and why we use it how we should use it and what kind of information we can gather from it and how it can help us move forward in terms of engine building especially in today's modern world of different bore materials, different ring materials and coatings and all of these things that have changed uh, that can allow much, much better performance of your engines. I was thinking about the other day, uh, you know, Rob mentioned, you know, the Engine Performance Expo, which I'm going to give a little shout out to, about that and talk about that more toward the middle of the presentation. Uh, but it really struck me, you know, Doug Yates was one of the speakers uh, on day one of the of the expo. And Doug made a really great point, something that I, it's very clear to me based on my experience in NASCAR as well, that, you know, 20 years ago in NASCAR, it was pretty common. You show up at the racetrack, you had three engines uh, for each weekend. You had a practice motor, a qualifying motor, and a race motor. And that race motor, it maybe ran the happy hour practice and then the full race. And then that engine had to be completely rebuilt you know, torn down and, and all, all that to go again the next race. Now, the short blocks, the complete engines, not just the short block, but complete engine can run three races. Well, what's changed? Well, one of the things is the fact that, you know, in the old days we were running, you know, ductile molly type rings. They were diamond finish and all that kind of stuff. But today we're running steel rings with, you know, PVD coatings on them. And that change in oils, cylinder material, ring materials, coatings, all of these things that make up this soup that we call ring seal, because it's not just one of those components, it's all of them working together as a combination. That's what's allowed this increase in longevity to maintain that performance uh, level, actually even have a higher level of performance than the old materials would allow. And most importantly, there's no drop off in that performance over time. That that performance can basically actually increase and then maintain versus having it's the best it's going to be right off the dyno fresh and then it's just going to age over time and drop off. We don't see that anymore. And a lot of it is those changes. And the reason I'm saying all this is the preface to say to actualize that, to take advantage of that outside of the professional race engine environment. And believe me, you can utilize this outside of the professional race engine environment. This is not something that's only limited to NASCAR and Formula One and Pro Stock. This technology can be employed on a daily driver engine for, or a diesel or an industrial engine. These levels of efficiency are available to every engine, but we have to have the proper tools, the proper mindset to achieve it. The profilometer is one of the tools that enables and that performance and lets you put it to work. So with that being said, let's get this profilometer work. Let's get started on a presentation. And I have to say this, I got to give a shout out to my my buddy Scooter Brothers at Comp Cams because you know, this is I stole this from Billy saying it. So it's this Billy quoting Scooter, but you can't change what you can't measure. And that's one of the stories that Scooter would tell you know Billy when Billy wanted to get a CNC machine to CNC grind camshafts. He's like, you doesn't make a difference to have that CNC machine versus a Burko if you can't measure the difference in how the machine makes the camshaft. So what they do, they had to buy an ADCO first to be able to measure what you're making. Then you can begin to you know, change your process and know that you're heading in the direction 
you want to go. You're not just making changes and hoping you end up where you want to go. You have to have that measurement system in order to know where you're going. And it's really important when we're talking about surface finish, because what we're really talking about here are micro inches. And that says micron here. And uh, micron is the metric side. Micro inches is um, you know the, the imperial side and we're going to talk more about micro inches but this because i found this on the internet <laughs> we're going to use the micron example um you know the human hair is that large outlined circle that gives you an idea of what a micron is in, in terms of um relative comparison so that human hair is that big outline circle that one micron is the smallest dot within there. Now, right above that small dot is a tenth of a thousandth. Just keep that in mind because we're going to talk about tenths of thousandths a lot today because uh, it's very important to understand when we're talking about surface finish, we're not talking about thousandths. We're talking about tenths of thousandths making a difference here. So to have that level of precision, we need, like, like it says at the very bottom down here, a tenth of a thousandth is equivalent to 100 micro inches. So just write that down in your notes. This is an important parameter to keep in mind because when we're talking about surface finish, these peaks and valleys, the thing the profilometer can measure, the scale we need to keep in our mind is we're talking tenths of thousandths, 100 micro inches. That's kind of our going to be our yardstick, if you will, as we go through this conversation today. Here's a perfect example, um, looking at the readout of the Mitutoyo, uh SJ210, which is just the one that I happen to happen to have. I mean, there's more than uh, the Mitutoyo ones out there. Uh, it's the one that I use uh, that we have at Total Seal, and what we're that's kind of our reference point. But again, there's other ones out there. Uh, that, you know, any of them that do this are going to basically be able to give you the same thing. Uh, what you're looking at on that scale, and you can see the block in the background that's been measured, and that's a, a run block, and it's got a little bit of time on it. The key thing I want you to pay attention to in this picture of the readout, you know, is that's the trace uh, of the cylinder profile, not just the actual values, but the actual trace, the up and down movement of the needle and the stylus across uh, that surface. You can see the peaks and the valleys all across there, but I want you to pay attention to the scale. So the scale of that, that trace is plus or minus 200 micro inches, okay? So if you think about that, 200 micro inches is four tenths. That's from the very top to the very bottom. And as you can see, looking at, at that, gra that graph, the majority of the surface finish, that texture, the up and down, is essentially about 100 micro inches. So essentially, we're talking about a tenth is what is going to be um, what your surface finish is. Of course, we're talking about tenth in a bore. I mean, you're measuring a gauge. That's going to be two tenths on the gauge. So make sure we keep that in mind that we're talking about two tenths on the gauge is one tenth each side of the bore. So just kind of, again, frame of reference. Um, I'm sure most people already know that, but I want to make sure that uh, we're all on the same page and we're all you know, talking in the same terms and are on the same foundation as we begin to build from here. And here's the thing, like I said, you know, kind of the very top, you know, because we're dealing with something that is a micro level, you know, it's very small, we need to have a tool that can do that. And that's where the, the profilometer is the thing that you have to have. You can't visibly see this, you can't feel it with your fingernail, it's just not the same. And I'm going to kind of divulge here just for a second. Um, the reason, well, actually, I'm going to move to the next slide, then I'll divulge into my little thing. Because I think this is probably a good thing to talk about before I go off into my little rant here uh, for a second, is that oil is the gasket that seals the piston ring to the cylinder wall. Uh, there was actually an article I wrote that in the previous issue of Engine Professional Magazine that, that talks about this at, at length, uh, so I won't repeat the whole article here right now, but you know, just like you wouldn't put 
a piece of iron, like an iron gasket, if you will, between the block and the cylinder head and expect it to seal good because it can't follow the irregularities. Okay, we know that that surface finish of the cylinder wall is going to have the peaks and valleys. So what's going to be the seal between that ring and the cylinder wall, between the ring and the ring land and the piston? Oil is the gasket no different than a rear main seal. The rear main seal, that lip isn't fully contacting the crankshaft. There's a small, small gap in there. Once it's broken in, it's the surface tension of the oil that is the final gasket, if you will, between the crankshaft and the lip seal. Okay, so with that in mind, think about what the oil is doing between the cylinder wall and the ring and the ring land. It's the gasket, and of course, if you ever, you know, checked an engine that's bone dry with no lubes on the wall and done a leak down on it and then put some oil in there, you know that you put oil in there, it will change the leak down numbers. It will improve that. Why? Because oil is the gasket. Okay, so where was I gonna go with my rant? Uh, my rant is, is really about, okay, why surface finish values have changed why we do we even need a profilometer to even understand any of this? And in, the reality is, what we said here is, you know, the cylinder wall, that surface finish is what holds the oil, okay? It's those peaks and valleys in the finish. And it's not crosshatch angle that does that. It's the peaks and the valleys that hold the oil so that it can be that gasket. Because if there's if it's completely smooth, it can't hold any oil, which means you're not going to be able to have the gasket that you need, and it's, you're also it's not going to hold enough oil to lubricate the ring, because that's the ring's got to do you know basically two things. It's got to seal, uh, it's got to transfer heat, it's got to be able there to do all that. Uh, but we got to protect the ring, so we got to lubricate the ring. But we also have to have it sealed. So the oil's got to kind of do both things. It's got to lubricate the ring. It's got to act as that gasket. So we got to have it where it needs to be. Now, proper lubrications, right oil, right place, right time, right amount. And it's that surface finish that provides those last three, the amount, place, and time um, is part of that, that whole process. So where was I going with all this? In the old days, going way back when we had, you know, chrome-faced rings, which basically were cast iron rings with a chrome plating on the face of them, it was pretty common in those old days to have a pretty rough surface finish on the gray cast iron blocks of the day. The reason for that is because that chrome plating process you know, is, a, is a dip. So even if the ring was perfectly circled, no light you know, gaps at all, brand new, well, there's going to be an irregularity from the chrome plating process. So for it to seal properly, you had to wear that chrome in a little bit. So that rough surface on the cylinder wall allowed that ring to break in, which is where the whole concept of ring break in came in. And that's where one of the concepts of, oh, don't use synthetic oil to break in a ring. It'll never seat in. Well, it, too slippery for a chrome ring, it wouldn't allow it to break in, so it would never seal up. Then you move forward and we go away from chrome rings or chrome faced rings, I should say, to molly faced rings. So now molly is softer, it's gonna bed in easier. Most importantly, molly has porosity. So it can hold oil, it can be almost its own sponge. So when you had a molly faced ring, because of that porosity, now you didn't really need as much oil in the cylinder wall retention as you did maybe an older style ring uh, with like say chrome and stuff, um, because one is not, doesn't have to be as aggressive on the surface because you're not having to break it in as hard because it's a softer material that's gonna wear in easier by itself. But also you, the ring is holding oil. Of course, the downside to all the, the cast materials is, I mean, they are cast, they're, they can't handle the heat that steel can, they're not as malleable. You know, the piston ring is not a structural component of the piston. The wrist pin is, but not the piston ring. The piston ring is a seal. 
So if we want it to be malleable. We want it to be able to move and conform. It's going to seal better that way. It doesn't need to be strong. It needs to be malleable, but also maintain its strength so that it doesn't just yield and lose tension uh, over time and, it, and with heat. So that's where you know the steel rings have an advantage material-wise over the cast rings. Trick is you get the steel rings. Now you're going to go to either you know a nitrided steel ring or a PVD coated ring. In most cases, well those coatings or lack of coating, there's no porosity. So now the impetus is back on the cylinder wall having the proper roughness to hold the oil to be able to lubricate the ring and to be able to be the seal. It's all back on the cylinder wall now. So that's the reason why I wanted to kind of give that perspective. Okay, why are we talking about cylinder finish? Why is it so important? Uh, why do we need this uh, profilometer? Is because we're, we got to have the correct surface finish and we got to be able to measure that finish to make sure we're getting the correct finish based on the needs of the application. And that's really where uh, the profilometer comes in really handy. And when we start talking about the profilometer, when we start talking about these surface finish values, the first thing I want to talk about and, and just show you right here is that roughness average RA really means nothing. And I know there's lots of reference books in the industry that's okay, if you just use you know, this grid abrasive and it's going to give you an RA of X. Okay, great. As you can see right here in your screen, here's the RA of nine essentially on two different traces, yet the RK, the core roughness, the RPK, the, the peak height, and the RVK, the valley depth, that's what holds the oil is the RVK, right? So the rings are going to see the RPK. Those are the things that's going to be hit and that's going to create the, the wear. What supports the load the, the ring is placing on the cylinder wall is the RK and what is going to hold the oil to be able to provide that seal, provide the lubrication is your RVK. Those are very different surfaces, yet they have the same RA. So first thing lesson learned is RA means nothing. You, we have to look beyond RA because RA alone will flat lie to you. Um, to really go deep, and we don't have enough time here because I could literally talk all afternoon and I'd be happy to do it, but I'm sure my boss wants me to get back to work and you probably need to get back to work too at some point. Uh, to learn more about these specific values and what they mean and how to interpret them, go to digitalmetrology.com. Uh, Mark Malberg has a great series, this notepad uh, series of videos. He goes through, and they're short little YouTube videos, about five minutes each that explains each of these things in really great detail with really good analogies that make it really clear, much better communicator than I am. So I would definitely recommend if you're serious about um, surface finish and improving your program and you know, unlocking the full potential of what's available today and just minimizing you know, issues and problems, you know, having a profilometer is a pretty big part of that. But if you have a profilometer, you need to watch all these videos as well to make sure you understand all these parameters clearly and how they all relate together because it's really good foundational information to have. And, and Mark's made this available for free to everybody. So it's a really great free resource for the industry. Uh, again, the websites, digitalmetrology.com, notepad series of videos. Can't recommend that enough. And then Kind of moving forward is this is from my mom. My mom gave me this um, thing. You must inspect what you expect. So that's the real key thing. Going back to what Scooter said, you know, you can't change what you can't measure. You know, if if you're expecting to have a certain finish, then you need to be able to inspect it uh, along the way to make sure that you're actually achieving what you're expecting to achieve. And that's where the profilometer gives you that tool to be able to see something that small that your eyes can't see, but can affect the performance and the longevity of the engine. And you know, different materials uh, are gonna give you different um, values to shoot for. Um, and it's, I mean, different applications are gonna require different values to shoot for. Uh, for example, you know, what you're looking at in this picture right here is a sumabore uh, coated 
engine from a Porsche engine, uh, Charles uh, Navarro, my buddies at LN Engineering and Jake Raby and uh, Flat Six, their whole group working together, doing some work with Sumabore for the aftermarket, not even for a race application, but more of a street performance, occasional track car type application, you know, employing Sumabore as opposed to Nicosil. And one of the key things that you can see with the Sumabore is that it's very plateaued, flat on top with the valleys underneath. It's a really nice finish. But Nicosil is, is different. Uh, Nicosil being a, a plating, not a coating, like Sumabore is, and being that it's got these silicon nodules, they're more vertical. It, you know, that surface pro profile of Nicosil is going to look very different than the correct surface profile of a Sumabore engine, when Sumabore is going to look different uh, surface profile than, say, a, a Darton, you know, a cast iron sleeve. You know, so it, the trick is from, a, say, a gray cast iron block to a compacted graphite block to an aluminum block with you know, ductile sleeves to an aluminum block with Nicosil or Sumabore you're going to have different surface finishes is you're going to have different amounts uh, or different honing techniques in order to achieve the proper surface finish based on those materials and applications so that's kind of the key thing to understand i know that we did a webinar back in the fall um, with keith jones and ed kubler from rottler where we went through all of this and really talked about okay how do you go about achieving those so we're not going to get into that today if you're interested in, in understanding more about that i would look back to uh, that video there or the previous webinar also in the engine performance expo we have a video uh, that ed did that goes about showing exactly how to achieve the different finishes and what abrasives they would uh in process they recommend in order to achieve the different finishes uh, so again that's not the scope of the day's conversation but the whole idea is because there are different blocks, if you're doing a 5.9 Cummins, a lot of those are compacted graphite. Well, that's going to be really different. Um, you can run the same feed, the same speed, the same abrasive in a compacted graphite block and get a completely different surface finish than you will in a gray cast iron block because they're different materials. Uh, so just know that that's why this tool is really important uh, to be able to understand that. Now, in terms of, okay, what numbers am I looking for? What am I trying to achieve? So the typical finish that's going to work for, say, 90% of the applications that, you know, for general performance, you know, some racing applications that are nothing too wild, too crazy, uh, an RPK value of 10 to 15, an RK value of 40 to 45, and this is all micro inches, by the way, not microns. Uh, there's a, a setting on on the uh, device that will basically say which one do you want to be. These are, this is all micro inches. Um, so 40 to 45 and an RVK of 50 to 55. That, that's a good finish. That's gonna get, get be very durable. It's gonna hold enough oil. Uh, it's not gonna be too rough. It's not gonna eat the rings up, but it's not gonna be too smooth where it doesn't uh, hold enough oil and wears out quickly. Uh, so that's a good set finish for the majority of the applications. Now. When you get into what we call, you know, serious boosted applications uh, where you're putting more load, uh, creating more cylinder pressure, essentially. And a lot of times when you're doing that, you're also putting more fuel in. And this is probably a good time as any to say, uh, even if it's not a boosted application, when you're running, say, gasoline compared to, say, methanol, going to methanol because you're using more fuel and it's the fuel that's going to wash the oil off the cylinder wall. Okay, need a little more valley, maybe a little more RK, a little more core roughness to hold a little bit more oil in order to offset the additional fuel that's coming in that's trying to wash away that lubricating film that's going to, one, lubricate the ring to protect it. Number two, create the seal. Uh, and we've seen that. I've seen... Um, situations where say an injected alcohol sprint car engine just by changing the injector style be it a spray versus a squirt it can have an immediate impact on vacuum 
Why? Because that fuel, if it's allowed to hit directly on the cylinder wall, is going to wash the oil down, basically thin it out, wash it away. It's going to lose some seal because you're washing away your gasket. So that's why that change in vacuum occurred. So just keep that in mind that, you know, this is a typical finished 90% of applications. That's going to be mostly gasoline applications as well. It's not going to hurt you to have in a injected alcohol uh, or boosted application to go to that next set of values, that 20, uh, 10 to 20 on the RPK, that RK is going to go up 50 to 60, it's going to move up a little bit, and your RVK is going to get that 60 to 67, 60 to 70 range, that's where you need to be, and then um, as Keith Jones coined it, crazy diesel applications, those the, that RK and that RVK just keep getting deeper and deeper because in so many of the diesel applications, you're running so much fuel in these crazy compound turbo, you know, 300 PSI boost applications. You're just dumping fuel in there like you're open to fire hose. And so when you do that to protect the ring, to seal properly, you just have to have a ton more oil available. Therefore, you get these looks to be pretty crazy looking numbers um, on terms of your RK and RVK, which by the way, those numbers, even though they look crazy compared to the top ones, they're not that nuts compared to some of the old school two cycle uh, finishes. You know, my dad still does all this vintage go-karting stuff. And of course got the profilometer, went over to dad's place and checked some of the old uh, air-cooled two-stroke cylinders that run on methanol. And oh yeah, they're, they're even rougher than the crazy diesel applications. Um, you know, part of that's chrome rings, but also too, you got to hold enough oil. Uh, and of course you got to try to you know, grab the oil out of the two-stroke mix. Uh, so there's all these th things to kind of keep in mind, uh, you know, the, on the other application, you get into your, you know, real high performance stuff where you're not afraid to, to freshen the engine up a little more often. Um, you can get a little skinnier uh, on those numbers. You can go a little bit smoother um, when you're pulling vacuum and you've got, you know, some thinner oils and you're not as much concerned about the longevity of the finish as you as you are, I want to make more vacuum. I want to make more power, more vacuum. I'm going to go a little bit smoother. So your RPK is going to come down a little bit. Your RK is going to drop. Still try to keep as much value as you can to hold that oil, but you're trying to, again, reduce blow by. And then, of course, you know, your NASCAR, your pro stock, you're trying to get every little thing you can out of it ap application. Then those gets even smoother. And, of course, some of those applications, you're talking about compacted graphite blocks, too. So those blocks are much harder they're not going to wear as quickly so you can get away with that harder material with a smoother finish because it's not going to wear as fast it can have longevity especially with you know really good quality oils and with uh really high quality rings and the advanced ring coatings all that that soup can work there so that's the whole thing to keep in mind that all of these things we're talking about they're soup they're not steak you know that's probably the best analogy i can give you when we're thinking about ring seal, it's not like, you know, if you order a steak dinner where you got your steak, you got your potatoes, and you got your broccoli, and they're, they're all cooked, but they're all cooked separately. They're just on your same plate to be your dinner. Nope. Ring seal is all about soup. All those things, the oil, the ring, the cylinder finish, the piston, they all have to work together for it to come out correctly. So just kind of keep that in mind as we go through this. Other thing too, besides just having your initial surface finish values as something to look at and to measure uh, with the profilometer, is you can also use this to measure cylinder finish in the change over time. A fun thing to do, especially is, let's say you've got some, uh, do, do some engines that have, you know, old school 16th, 16th, 3 16th uh, ring packages, especially with, you know, real high tension oil rings. Uh, check all those numbers before you put the short block together then once you're done putting the short block together before you go and put the uh the heads on it check it again and see how much it changed and you'll see that just putting their engine together just the short block turning it over you're going to start to see 
some uh, reduction in those peaks as the rings start to kind of work themselves in uh, to the cylinder wall. And then imagine by the time you put the heads on and you finish setting the valves, it's going to do that yet again, all that before you even crank the engine up. So one thing you can do, and this is a, a flat four engine, it's a sumo bore engine, by the way, uh, that my buddies, uh, Jake, Jake Raby uh, at uh, Flat Six Innovations and Raby Engine Technology, Raby, eh, Raby Air Cool Technologies, um, has been working on doing some sumo bore stuff that you know, over time, as we're going through iterations of the test, we can measure and keep track of those values. And what's really neat is you can see that, you know, they really don't change. You know, they, they're pretty consistent. And you can see some variation there, but you got to remember, because sumo bore is a spray coating, those valleys and everything, it's isometric. It's it's not sitting, the, the way, way it works is it's not so much the, the abrasive that's creating the valley like you would have on a traditional material. In this case, those valleys are caused by the voids they're left of the porosity left in the coating process itself. So because of it being random that way, that's why you see some of those more variation on the RVK than you do the other parts and the RK varies a little bit. Uh, it's because of that, that pro profile. But again, the point of me showing this is that it gives you a tool not only to check what is it brand new you know, out of the home, but what's happening to that surface finish over time? Uh, and you can always use it to check a, a, an engine uh, that's come back. And you can measure, especially uh, at the bottom of a sleeve, at the bottom of a cylinder, uh, over near where the wrist pin goes in as, uh, on a side relief uh, piston, that area, the rings won't have run there and there won't be a piston skirt over there. You can grab a little uh, sample from that area and that will tell you what the hone of that engine was brand new, then you can compare it to you know, mid-stroke where you had the least amount of ring contact. And of course, you know, top of the stroke is you're going to have the most amount of contact. You can kind of get all those points and it, again, helps you paint a picture of what's going on with that engine. Where did it begin? Where has it ended up? And, you know, it was it happy or unhappy? It can, all that information you can gather uh, from the tool. Uh, again, uh, just to go back, the things we've already talked about, if you want to go deeper, engineperformanceexpo.com, the videos are available there right now. Uh, you can go and, and watch any of the individual segments. The full day recordings are available and you can fast forward uh, through those if you want to get to where you, you, you want to see. There's lots of talk there uh, about surface finish, in much greater detail, how to achieve those surface finishes, uh, all the, the honing specific stuff is in greater detail there. Plus, there's a bunch of other great cool stuff. I and mean, if you're interested in this, you're going to be interested in the things that are available uh, at that event. So you can go check that out. And again, it's completely free. So with that said, let's go ahead and break out the tool, which means I need to go over here and I need to quit out of the slideshow. All right, I'm going to blow that out here. Okay, so this is our handy dandy profilometer. Again, this is the Mitotoyo. SJ210 that we have at Total Seal. In a uh, couple of things about this little piece that I want to talk about. Um, one, the stylus is in here and it comes where you can take it out. So what I like to do is take it out. It comes with an extension cord uh, that makes it much easier to use. And what we're going to do is we're just going to measure a cylinder uh, that I happen to have here right now. This particular cylinder that I have is a air-cooled Porsche 356 uh, cylinder that uh, it's nickel, it's all aluminum uh, that was given to me by my buddy uh, Charles Navarro at L Engineering. So I got to give him a little shout out for helping us out. The thing's pretty simple. Um, one cool thing, uh, I'll give you a little bit of an ad here just for a second. If you choose, if you want one of these, you can get them from Total Seal. One of the advantages from buying them from Total Seal is that Keith Jones, uh, who's our head technical guy, he actually takes them out of the box, calibrates it, sets everything up for you so that it has all the, the numbers in the area you want them and the correct calibrations, everything, so that when you get it, all you have to do is take it out of the box and start using it because it's already been set up for you. That's one it, you know, freebie you get, or if you want to call it, uh, built into the cost of what you pay when you buy one from Total Seal. Um, that's part of it. Now, one thing I don't like about this thing, and you, you can, it's a setting, you can change it, is that 
to save the battery, it, it turns itself off in like 30 seconds. <laughs> it doesn't take very long. Uh, so if you, if you plug it in, there is an adapter you can plug it in. So if you're using it, say at a home, you can plug it in. It just stays on if you plug it in. But if you're using it remotely, just know that the thing turns itself off. All you gotta do is push the button, it turns right back on pretty easy. So what I've done here so far is I've taken profilometer, I've hooked it all up uh, for the extension. Now, next thing I'm gonna do, again, I know I sound like an infomercial here right now, so just know that. Uh, this little tool from Brad Lagman at QMP Racing is a lifesaver, game changer. This little piece goes right on the profilometer. I gotta grab my little Allen wrench because Brad's got it where he's got these little bitty buttons. I'm gonna try to hold it up. Little plastic buttons in there. That way you can, it'll hold it in place. Now, if you've used one of these, you know where I'm going with this. Plus it's got this really awesome little adapter that can you know, set it to size. So what I can do is place it on here. I'm going to tighten it up. All right, so now I've located, I've got it tightened up. Now what I can do, and trust me, I know 100% what I'm doing right now is wrong. I'm going to hold it so you can see it. The problem is me holding it, I can introduce vibrations to it and all that. So this is for demonstration purposes only, not for technical <laughs> evaluation of the profile of the cylinder. So what I'll do is I'll go from the back side up. So if you want to get you know, the top of the cylinder, you got to go from this side to be able to hold it. And I'm going to place our device in there and I'm going to position it so I can catch that part of the cylinder. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the thread tool, right? And I'm going to thread it up so that it's holding the stylus in place. So you can see right there that this is the area I'm gonna trace, the tools holding it in place. Then all I have to do, I'm gonna turn the device on and then I'm gonna press start. And the problem with this thing right now is that it's gonna be so bright on the screen that you're probably you probably can't see it at all but one good thing is once it's done tracing the light will the, the black light will come down so there you go that gives you an idea of what the surface finish values are uh on a nicosil cylinder and you can see it's really really different okay bingo there you go so you can see it's very different you're talking about an ra of six an rk of 18 uh, our BK of five, uh, our VK of 12, pretty flat. One thing you can do too is you can kind of scroll across here and we're gonna get a, a, that horizontal trace of the cylinder. Of course, we gotta wait for a second here and let it dim itself back out so you can actually see what's on there. But there you can see. So a Nicosil cylinder, that trace, you can see is very different than what you saw with the Sumabore cylinder. And what you probably can't tell is the, okay, here you go. You may be able to see it now. The the range value is plus or minus 80. So it's really, really narrow range of roughness. It's not big like the, the plus or minus 200. So this is a tighter range. There's still some roughness in there. So again, this is a pretty easy little device to use that again, is very portable and you can put it in. What I really like about it is like you said, with the, with the addition of the, the holder is that you can check any direction you want to. You can check on the thrust side uh, of the cylinder. You can check on the anti-thrust side. You can check 90 degrees from the thrust. It's pretty easy. All you have to do is adjust. Uh, in this case, I say I'm going to adjust and retighten. All right. So I've got my cylinder here in place, I've adjusted it now. Now I'm, I'm gonna hold it up that way so you can see the, the uh, stylus move when we run it again. So let's turn her on because she turned herself off again. And now we're gonna hit 
start and it's going to be in a trace. You can see that little bitty tip moving. So you see it doesn't really take a really large area uh, to, to, to trace and again consistency is going to be pretty close. You know the same numbers are pretty similar to what they were before and you know some cylinders uh, like materials are going to be more consistent than others. You see, again, these numbers aren't very far off, and it gives you, gives you an idea that there's going to be some bounce in, in these devices. So if you're moving one, two uh, micro inches, that's not to worry about. You move 10 micro inches, that's something more significant to, to think about and say, okay, well, what? that's a big variance. It went from you know 10 uh, to 20. Okay, that's a big move. If it moves from 10 to 12 to Eight, I, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Uh, again, you can always take another tr a sample and trace. Uh, I know some guys, uh, again, talking about Brad at QMP that makes the holder. Uh, he uses these things for all the blocks he does. He actually has an Excel program where he's got the software set up where it exports all of that data into an Excel spreadsheet. And then he takes four traces, uh, four samples, if you will, from each cylinder, and then it averages it and gives it an average value to take some of that bounce uh, out of the number. So again, it's a really great tool. As you see, it is super simple and easy to use. There's no rocket surgery going on here. Thank you, Ben Strader, for that, that line. Um, going on to make this happen. It's pretty easy to use. Anyone can access this tool. It's not incredibly expensive. I know we're going to do a deal for everybody that's watching today on uh, the webinar that you can buy them from Total Seal for $2,000.99. $2,099 uh, is the number, which that's a couple hundred bucks off of what the normal price is. Um, but again, if you get it from us, we get it. That's the, that's the Mitotoyo one. Uh, Federal makes one. Um, and there's a few other ones. I, I, I think Mar and Federal are the same thing, but I know there's, there's some out there. So again, it's a pretty great tool pretty easy to use. Um, so with that, let's turn over some questions. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them at this time. Super. Thanks, Lake. No, great presentation. A couple of questions coming in and they are, they are, they're asking basically about the, that holder. You know, they're asking uh, <laughs> if, you, if you could mention who, who makes that holder again, who is the, the, okay. the maker of that? All right. So the holder, yes, this is the coolest thing in the whole wide world. Um, Brad Lagman, QMP, like Queen Mary Paul, QMP Racing in California. He makes these things, and they're not incredibly expensive. And you probably can't see it on my screen, but Brad, QMP Racing, he makes this thing. This is by far, I, I wouldn't buy the profilometer if you're not willing to spend the extra 75 bucks or whatever it is to buy this little thing because this makes saves the day uh especially when you have a block in a home uh yesterday i was over uh good uh, good buddy's shop and they were doing some work on a an engine that they hadn't worked on that particular uh type of bore material before and uh, brad actually helped us out but this is one of the cool tools that we can capture different areas of the cylinder to see what's going on and then go back and measure so we can get that average uh this lets you go in there and do it without having to pull the engine out of the hone. You can go check cylinders while it's in the hone. It's a must have, in my opinion. Okay, all right. And you mentioned this is a Mitotoyu um, profilometer. What model is that, Lake? Uh, this is an SJ210, is this okay. what this model is. Okay, now, super. Yeah, and there's the thing with, say, so Mitotoyu has free software that comes with it that allows you to export the data from the SJ210 to a uh, PC computer. Um, it doesn't work for Macs, but they do. It does for, for PCs. Uh, so they've got some free software you can you can use to export it and, and do that. Um, I'm just going to be honest. I, I mean, I've got the SD card in here to save it, and I can I do save uh some of the scans that are in here but more times than not it's my phone that i have stuff in i mean if you go to my camera roll 
on my phone, what you're going to find is, I'm just going to roll and show you, I, I've got all kinds of pictures of profile traces. I mean, you just look at my history. <laughs> uh, that's what you do is you're in a guy. That's what's great about this device. Uh, of course, I travel a lot. Um, so this is something I can take with me everywhere I go. Uh, TSA has never given me too hard a time about it yet. And then you can scan a guy's block right there uh, in the shop. And then you can go ahead and take a picture of it and save it. And you kind of know where it was. So my I know that's not the most technical way of doing it, but I, I my that's how I document most of my stuff uh, with this device is using my phone to take a, a picture of the results. Okay, um, we even had a couple of questions come in before the webinar, Lake, um, and this this particular person would like to know, you know, how much does cleaning the surface affect measurement? Does honing oil on the surface affect the measurement as well? Oh, great question. I'm glad somebody asked that. Yes, it will definitely affect the surface finish uh, result. So you do want to clean that surface uh, the best you can. Now, you don't need to sit there and sonic clean it and, and do all that. But, you know, for example, uh, you know, yesterday we were checking that block. Um, yeah, we, you know, when we were really first getting after it, kind of just getting the uh, basic idea of what was going on, you, you know, clean rag, Go in there and wipe the area that you're going to scan, and then they go ahead and check it. And as we honed more and we were uh, really trying to get more precise on our numbers, then we would actually take a clean rag, spray some solvent on it. So you didn't want to spray it, you know, spray solvent inside your hone and really you know mess up your honing oil. Uh, but we want to put some solvent on the rag so we can get that area really clean, so we're really more accurate. You know. To do it the best would be some solvent, lint-free towel. That would be the best way to do it so that you know you don't have anything influencing the roughness. And one thing you can see, too, when you look at the scan as it comes across, that live scan, if you see something that looks like a bump, okay, you know, use common sense, all right? That may have been a piece of debris or something like that. Let's go back and clean it again or move the location a tiny little bit and see. Uh, so that's the biggest thing. Just use some common sense when you're doing it. And then if you see someone that's an outlier, then if it doesn't repeat, then it's not real. All right. Um, another question, Lake, that came in before the webinar was, what about reverse rotation of the honing process? Does that make a difference? Well, yes. So, I mean, uh, that's one thing is if when you're, you spin it down one direction, spin it back the other, um, you know, some people like doing that because it can actually, depending upon what kind of abrasive you're using, it can take some of those peaks as opposed to folding it only one direction, it can actually fold it backwards or maybe break it off. So, um, that's one of those cool things about the profilometer that it can be very handy is if you have a question about your honing process and what finish I'm actually achieving, you can try all these different things, you know, you know, just normal one direction or doing reverse rotation. You can see if it actually makes a difference because you know, some abrasive, some materials, it might, other things it may not. The only way to know is to measure it. And that's why it's a great tool to be able to do that. Okay. All right. Um, what is the best scale to measure camshaft finish? <laughs> so i probably wouldn't recommend using this for camshaft finish um the zeiss profilometer that the guys at comp have um is much much more accurate uh the isolation table everything about it to reduce or you know, minimize any kind of vibration or uh environmental influence on the result is very precise it's it's controlled so that you can take a very smooth surface which is what the camshaft needs to be and be able to see those small variances and it will show you uh what the the scale is uh based on the radius of the cam or wrist taper for flat tap it um these devices are really good for a rougher surface like a cylinder uh, i think this is a good device for cylinders because while it's not as precise as say a Zeiss stationary mount unit, 
that we would use for to do camshaft finishes uh, in profile, right? Because that's the other thing too, is that with cams, one of the things you're looking for isn't just say the surface finish of the camshaft itself, but really what's really important is the actual shape of the lobe. What's a taper? Uh, is there or a crown or is there, uh, is it concave? All, all kinds of stuff. Is it wavy? Is it bumpy? Uh, not just surface wave, but waviness. Again, back to uh, the videos that Mark has, you can you can a little, little more about that, that, you know, surface finishes one thing in terms of just that roughness averages and the RPKs and RVKs, but waviness, contour, those are things, and that's where the, the higher dollar equipment would be a better option for that. But just for cylinder stuff, this will get the job done really well. Okay, so this kind of goes into the next question, Lake. So it kind of asked, you know, what brand of profilometer is best? So I guess if maybe if, if money wasn't an object, you know, do you have a recommendation there? If, you know, if let's say someone wants to go for the, you know, for the full meal deal? So here's my two cents, you know, world according to Lake. Uh, soapbox speech. I've lived for a little over 49 years now, and the one thing that I've learned in life that there is no best. There's a right for the application, but there is no best. Um, the highest end, most accurate profilometers are giant, huge Zeiss units. Uh, good luck putting that in your home and be able to measure your block while you have it in the home. You're never going to be able to do that, so it's not the right tool for the job. So what I think what we were trying to go is I, I wouldn't tie cost to the equation on the front end. I would start with, okay, what am I trying to do? If I want to measure surface finish while I have a block in the hone, I'm going to do something like this because this is gonna tell me what I need to know, where I need to know it without doing extra work, you know, no extra time involved. This is a better tool for that job. If I'm looking at, all right, I've got a camshaft here, I've got a crankshaft, and I'm trying to really, you know, 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 know what I've got. All right, well then, you know, a, a larger stationary unit uh, that's more accurate could, could, could do that for you to a higher level of precision than this can. Doesn't mean you can't get a stationary mount for this thing and do that because you certainly can. Uh, I, I really like this unit because it's kind of the Swiss Army knife. It can do a whole lot of things for you. Uh, it's pretty portable. Now, it's not a chainsaw. If, when you need a chainsaw, you need a chainsaw. But most days, Swiss Army knife will get you out of a lot of jams. That's just, again, my two cents. And I probably didn't answer the guy's question right. He really wanted me to, but that, that's, again, sorry about that. <laughs> no, I think you covered it there. That was good. Um, next question for you is, what setting would you want for a supercharged engine burning methanol? Okay, so you're going to want more valley. Yeah, that's, that's the key thing is that um, – if you kind of look, find out where you are now, it typically back to that those numbers we were showing earlier, uh, that 70, 60, 70 on the RVK, your RK in the 40s, um, those are going to give you pretty, that's going to give you enough oil retention to handle that amount of fuel. You really don't want to be less than that um, because you, with supercharged methanol application, you're putting a lot of fuel through there. And you're typically going to be running a very high viscosity oil, which that, that's a good thing. That, that helps uh, offset that dilution as well. But you definitely want to have those that RVK value up, up in the, the 60 to 70s uh, range to hold enough oil. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll just mention to everybody, too, that, you know, typically we kind of hover around an hour for our webinars, but... I mean, this is really good information, Lake. We still got lots of questions, so ah, as long as we're not good. okay, we might as well. I mean, let's let's go through the questions. This is great material, and we don't get a chance to uh, to cover this kind of stuff all that often. So, one um, well, of the great things, Rob, is that if we answer the questions now while people are here, as opposed to just replying to the one person as a single email that no one no one else gets to hear the answer. This way, everybody gets to hear the answer, and I, I'm I'm happy to spend the time doing it. 
Excellent. No, we appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so this one's in regards to, uh, you know, what, what suggestions would you have for Nitro Funny Car, you know, for, for application? <laughs> you know, see, that's like the one thing that I've never had really any involvement in. Uh, the only time I've ever been around, it really been close to a, a Nitro Funny Car, uh, a Nitro Fuel Car, uh, was when I was working at, at Gibbs and Tony Stewart was still driving for us and he had the Old Spice sponsorship. Uh, at the same time, uh, John Force Racing also had a thing with uh, Old Spice. And it was when they first opened the Z-Max Drag Array here in, um, in Concord, you know, the four wides. And they were coming in to do a, it was for the uh, Coke 600, the Memorial Day weekend. Uh, they were going to do an exhibition on Pitt Road before the race to help kind of kick off uh, the fact that the drag strip would be opening. So the Force's guys had came into town to, to do that. The previous race, I think, was at Bristol or something like that. And because of them being over for Charlotte, they were going to go straight to the next race. And they had a problem at Br Bristol and they needed to use the shop to basically get everything turned around. So those guys hung out at our shop uh, for a week. So we had the you know, top fuel guys in the shop and we had you know the NASCAR guys in the shop. And, of course, we had to you know trade back and forth. Of course, me being the oil guy back then, I was like, oh, what, what do you have for oil? And it's like straight 70 Plus, it was, I think, like 60 Cinestokes. It was insane. And we're using 0, 020, and they're straight 70, and they couldn't believe our engines could live. And I'm like, I can't believe you put five gallons of nitro in your oil in five seconds. That's insane. How, how do you, how, what pump can put that much fuel in there? Um, with all that being said, back to the same thing. The more fuel you run through the engine, the more valley you need to be able to hold the oil and resist that fuel dilution. So I can't imagine, and I'm sure there's a few guys out there that know their stuff that will tell me I'm wrong and that's fine because I don't know what I'm talking about here, but I can't imagine that you would ever want to plateau hone anything going into a, a nitro car. Um, maybe a, a little bit on the tops to help blow by a little bit, man, but I would think you'd want some of that crazy diesel uh, type uh, valley in order to hold enough oil to because there's so much nitro going through that motor okay all right so this is kind of going back to what you were talking about with nicosil cylinders uh they've asked you know what what finish and numbers should you have with nicosil <sighs> that's a really good question so with nicosil it's going to be hard to have a lot of valley uh you're never going to get something that looks like um, that typical finish, uh, I'm going to go here, I'm looking away from you guys because my other monitor's over here and I can see my numbers because I don't want to quote the wrong number off the top of my head and get everybody in the wrong direction. But say for that typical finish that was, you know, an RPK of 10 to 15, an RK of 40 to 45, an RK of 50 to 55, you're never going to get that with Nicosil. And if you did, it'd probably eat the ring like it was a diamond cutting tool. It would be awful. So, but what could you get away with? I mean, if you could with that, you know, NASCAR pro stock type finish, if you could get the RPK somewhere around five, get the R RK somewhere low teens, get the RVK low twenties, then you, you, you really have something. It, it's tough with Nicosil to get enough valley. Uh, in Nicosil, Alucil, Lacosil, um, all the silicon um, impregnated components, you know, that's one of the things about them, um, or I say components, but surface surfaces. The, the trick is, and I'll turn this thing back on, we can go back over to the trace again and, and, and look at it. So, you know, the values we ran on that cylinder were uh, an RA of six, an R, RK of 18, RPK of five and an RVK of 10. So it was kind of falling in line what I was talking about. The trick is it didn't have as much valley as you want it to have. You'd rather have more valley, maybe a little less RK is what you'd really like to have. But when you look at that finish, it's going to go uh, dead here or not. It'll mute itself to some degree so it's not so bright. Um, there you go. That, that one's not too bad in terms of being all vertically aligned or 
you know, it's definitely not plateaued. Uh, you can you can tell, but you want to have as much valley as you can. It's kind of what my I'm always going to go to um, in order to hold oil. Now, there's a lot of core roughness in there, so it's going to hold a lot of oil. So you don't need to have it be in the 40s or 50s. There's no reason to try to get there. But if you can get it into those, you know, high teens, low 20s, more in the 20s if you can, then you'll have a surface that really holds oil well, and that will be a really long-lasting uh, finish. Okay, super. Um, next question is kind of relates to, have you, have you ever seen a printer for that SJ210? Have you ever seen anybody use one or be able to print from that profilometer? Well, I know the older ones had that ability. So some of the older models uh, of the profilometers, and I'm, I know there's an older model of the SJ, that it, it would have these printouts, you know, that would print on like laser paper and all that kind of stuff. So um, those are still out there somewhere. Um, and that you can definitely do that if you can find one of them. But I think what they've gone to anymore is the these have this little panel on the back that pops out. And you see, so you can't hook up a printer to it. It's got some cables. It even has the little memory card in there and it's got the U mini USB. So you can hook it up to uh, your computer. To me, what I would, obviously what I do right now is just take pictures, right? And that's pretty basic and lame, but it's what I do. Um, and one of the things I like doing, reason I like doing it that way actually is because your phone knows where you are and knows what date it is when you take it, I can go back and sort and look for images, uh, basically my data, based on if I know if I was at Brad Peters shop in Lake Fort, California, I can go and go look and find that data from Brad's. So I know that we were talking about what Brad, well, this is what he, what he was before. I, that's a way for me to kind of manage that data versus having to build spreadsheets and other things like that. So that's one reason why I do it. One is convenient. I don't have to have this thing hooked up and it's more portable, but also data management. Um, a time uh, t stamps on there as well, one way of doing it. Um, but I, I like the idea of being able to download it to the computer. Uh, there's some great software that lets you dive even, even deeper. Um, th that software translation, it, is really expensive though. Um, that's kind of the challenge uh, with all of this is that it's kind of like either you pay for this and you get the deal on this thing, but then the, the software to move it to this computer is greater um, or the, you do the your printer option can, can be there. So um, yeah, different ways of doing it. Okay. Um... So another question, Lake, is can you store the parameters in the SJ when you turn it off? They said they yes. just look on screen. Okay, they noticed it went yeah. back to the settings, but they were just curious if you can do that. Yeah, so from the this little thing slides down, right? So one thing I can do is I from here, I can hit my home screen, and then I can use this to arrow down. And here I've got measured data saved, right? So what I can do is I want to go here and read it's going to read that SD card. And then in here, I have all of these previous scans already saved. Oh, we mean no file. Oh, that's about hold on. That's the folder. I said, okay. You have all these folders. Let me get back up here to my um, first folder. And in my first folder here, those are the scans, right? And that, and so I can come here and say, okay, now I'm gonna load that saved file. So it's going there and looking and it's bringing up, okay, so you can't see it yet. So let, let it dim itself out here in a second. But yes, you can save um, the different scans to the disk and then you can recall them just like that. I think it oh. saves like up to a thousand. It's as I said, all those folders, and you can have so many scans in each folder. So yes, you can save it on there and and do it that way. 
Okay. All right. Uh, kind of going back to more of a uh, honing question here, but what are the challenges for those of us that are not running diamonds in our homes? Well, I mean, so diamonds are, is just an abrasive. You can achieve the same finish on, say, gray cast iron or even uh, ductile iron. You can achieve the same RPK, RVK values with conventional abrasive, CBN, or diamond. Um, now, there's pros and cons um, to each of them for you know, different reasons, um, which, again, that's not the real, the topic of this conversation. Uh, the previous webinar that we that is saved and you can watch uh, through AERA that, that Keith and Ed Keebler from Rottler did, they talked a little bit more about kind of the pros and cons of which abrasives uh, you can use. Uh, to achieve those finishes. So there's more than one way to get to that finish. Now, the texture of that finish in terms of how rough it is, you know, diamonds tend to leave things a little more rough because diamonds do more cutting than they do abrading. Uh, you know, traditional uh, vitrified abrasives, it's the bond is releasing the abrasive and it's that third body uh, wear. Um, so it's the silicon carbide or the aluminum oxide that's that's been released that's between the actual hone head and the the surface which is actually doing the digging and the cutting with a diamond type abrasive the the bond is much harder and you you're, you're not getting that frayability of the abrasive it's actually acting more like a single point cutting tool just a whole bunch of them which is one reason why um Again, an example this week, um, you have to use more load when you use diamonds to get them to cut. Uh, you, don't, you don't do it the same. But point being, I know for an example, uh, same material, two different people, two different places, two different types of abrasives can get to the same finish. Now the process and how much can, uh, what, what it costs you to do it in terms of time and all that, uh, varies, but you can get the same finish different places. So don't think that I have to have diamond abrasives to use a profilometer. No, no, you can use this on conventional abrasives. You don't need diamonds. This tells you surface finish. It doesn't care what abrasive you use. It doesn't care what type of coolant or oil you use. It doesn't care. It just gives you what the surface finish is based on what you did to it. Okay, so while we're on the top of that, uh, the topic of that lake, so here's another one. So, uh, is it critical to break in diamond and CBN abrasives for proper surface texture? Yeah, you know, talking to Ed at Rottler, and again, I'm not the abrasive uh, expert, although this is something I really do find greatly interesting. In fact, hang on, I'm going to show you something real quick. I had to roll my chair back up there. I was losing it. Um, this is one of my favorite books, Metalworking Fluids. And yes, it's about metalworking fluids, but the really cool part about the metalworking fluid book is that a whole bunch of it is all about actual, you know, cutting techniques, machinery, and metallurgy and wear types. So, um, I love this stuff. It's, it's, it's a ton of fun. Um, but to, to get to the really answer to that, that, that question, um, the honing techniques and are going to vary again, what you said before, based on, um, what the application is, material, when you get the diamonds and you're trying to break those in, there is a break-in process. Me, I, I know when we were doing some of the filming for the Engine Performance Expo, you know, Ed was looking at, we put some brand new diamonds in a brand new Rottler home. They were working on some some dart blocks for the video, um, the pre-recorded sections uh, for the expo. And, you know, Ed was looking at 
the diamonds abrasives as they were going through and he, he could see them breaking in and said, yeah, it's, you know, this, but his point was, it's going to cut better the longer you use it because as it breaks in, now you're going to get more area coming into contact. So it's going to be able to do more cutting um, as it breaks in. So uh, I definitely even diamond CBN, there is still a break in just like a conventional um, vitrified abrasive. All right. Okay, so going back to the profilometer here for a minute, uh, does Total Seal stock the diamond stylus or any batteries or anything, or do they do servicing on it? Like, is there anything that Total Seal does there for that? So when you buy the kit from us, it's basically, it has, the batteries are already in it, it's already charged, the stylus is already in it, it's, it's complete. I mean, it's literally, if you buy it from us, when it shows up, you can take it out of the box and start using it right away. You don't really have to do anything to it. It is fully charged, fully set up and formatted, ready to go. Uh, it doesn't include the SD card. You got to go get your own SD card because the SD card you need to format it uh, for it. Doesn't the the normal format that it comes in? It doesn't take it. You just got to put it in, and you can go in there and, and do that. So really, the only extras that you're going to need to buy um, to do it the exact same way I have it is the little micro SD card and then the holder from Brad. And then, then you got the same setup I have. Okay. So if they, if they needed any spare parts or like a stylus or something, then they would probably just go to Mitotoyu for Mitotoyu. that. Yeah. Mitotoyu yeah. has all that. We, we just have the complete units. We don't have any of the spare parts and we don't do service work on them. That's Mitotoyu. Oh. Okay. All right. Uh, so this next question is more in regards to rings. Um, so when doing cylinder leak down tests with 100 PSI shop air, would you expect mm -hmm. engines with gas ported pistons, vertical, horizontal, to have different higher leak down values than non-gas ported engines? Do gas ports create a leak path at 100 PSI is what they're asking. I've not seen that. In my experience, um, fact, uh, just Back to my buddy Jake Raby uh, that's been doing the sumo board testing uh, with he has a flat four uh, engine and because it's a modular engine essentially uh, individual cylinders you know bolted together we actually have run that engine with gas ported rings and this is I'm talking about a ring not a piston here so we're talking about gas ports and in this case I'm speaking about a gas ported ring not a gas ported piston um, we actually saw better leak down numbers on the gas ported side than we did the conventional side with 100 pounds of shop air. So yeah, we've not seen it hurt. Uh, but again, that's a gas ported ring, not a gas ported piston. Okay. All right. Now, uh, what about crankshaft surface finish? Can can this SJ can it read that? Oh yeah, it can read it. It, it can it can definitely read crankshaft finish. It can read deck finish on a block you can read it on a head you know in mls gaskets all those kind of things where you need to have surface finish this can tell you everything i mean and you can check a cam with it if you want to i just wouldn't check it with a cam and then call billy and argue with him about the numbers because you're, you're gonna lose <laughs> okay all right uh and so there this next question kind of is a, so is there a calibration method to verify results are accurate Yes. So uh, in the box, uh, Mitotoyo has a calibration standard. So there's a, a roughness standard in the box and there is a method. In fact, one of the things that comes with, with this the rolling around, I didn't expect to do, but you know, we'll figure that out. It'd help if I put these in my ears the right way. <laughs> so there is a quick start guide that comes in the box. Of course, I know screen wise, you get to see everything backwards. Um, but there, there's a little quick start guide that comes in the box that can show you uh, everything. And part of it is the calibration process. So if you start getting values and you're like, ah, something's not right here. Yeah, you can always go back and recalibrate it. It's very easy. We checked the calibration of mine not long ago. Uh, we were at a guy's shop, said, here, let's just check it. Let's make sure. You know, we, we ran his, we ran mine through the same block. Let's check them and let's see how they are. 
And of course, they're a little bit different. Uh, not too much. Put out this reference standard, check both of them. Okay, they're both good. So um, this is the quick guide that comes with it. If you really want to get crazy, it comes with this. So everything you want to know about your SJ210 comes in there. And again, that's just where I had to figure out the hard way about the SD card. There's a whole chapter and section in here about getting in there and, and formatting it properly. And other kind of cool thing uh, about this book actually is there is a lot of reference information in there. So if you really want to geek out about sine waves and things like that, it's in here. So there's more than just instructions on how to use it. There is this entire reference section that talks about the different standards and things like that. So it's a lot of a lot of good information that comes in the box with it besides just the tool itself. Okay. All right. Uh, does the use of oil squirters on the pistons allow you to use a smoother cylinder finish? Yes, it does, because um, you're putting more oil up there. So you're, again, proper lubrication, right oil, right place, right time, right amount. Uh, if you're just relying on splash in the crankcase, then you're going to have to have more valley to hold the oil. Um, when you've got squirters squirting on the bottom of the piston to cool the piston, that, that's what it's for. You run piston squirters not to lubricate the cylinder walls. Piston squirters are to cool the piston. Well, because of that, you're going to get a little bit more splash and stuff going on there. So you can typically get away with a little bit less um, valley um, to make that work. But there's a real, there's going to be a tipping point on all this. When you have more valley, you're going to get, you know, longer ring life. You're going to get longer bore life because you get, you're basically, you've got more oil which is a good thing. Now, when you start getting less valley, what's going to happen is to a point, you're going to start seeing a little bit less blow-by. Your blow-by can get a little bit better when you get a little bit smoother. But the problem is now the longevity, the durability of that, of that finish is going to be compromised some. And if you get too smooth, then your, your, your uh, blow-by goes way up. And that's kind of how you know you've gone way too smooth is when your, your blow-by takes off. Um, that, that mirror finish stuff, if it's not sumo bore, it can't be mirror finished. Now, sumo bore can be mirror finished because it's got all the voids in it and it can, it can like a sponge, it holds oil really well. Uh, so that's the exception of sumo bore to the mirror finish part, which is why in my limited experience so far with doing some of this testing with sumo bore, it's a pretty interesting bore material. Um, I think we're gonna see more and more of it in the future. Okay, um, here's another question. How important is low RPK? They found that it's hard for them to get below 14 without brushing and they prefer not to use brushes. Okay, so the RPK, you, okay, that's a great question actually because I keep on talking about valley, valley, valley. Uh, and you know, valley is what the oil sees, that's RVK. The RPK, those peaks, that's what the ring sees. Now, back to what I mentioned earlier about if you check it before you put the short block together and check it after, um, before you go adjust your hone, um, see what those number, uh, RPK numbers are after you put the short block together, but before you bolt the heads on and check it again and see how much RPK you're losing just by doing the short block assembly and use that as your reference to go forward. Because if, if it's where you want it to be before you crank the motor up, you're good. You don't need to change anything. Okay. All right. Um, this particular person has asked, uh, they've had a customer ask them for a 30 RMS finish on the block deck surface. Can that be measured with the SJ210? Yes. Okay. All right. Another question, what spec should we have for RPK and RVK on a crankshaft? Ooh. So with a crankshaft, you want a very smooth finish, obviously. You do not want a lot of peaks. Um, 
you want a very, very smooth surface finish on, on a crankshaft. Um, it's that, back to that, the Suma bore look. Um, you don't want a lot of valley though. Um, it doesn't hurt you if you have some valley, but that RK needs to be very smooth. Typically, I know I'm using RA uh, here and RA is a terrible number for that, but I really don't have in my head um, what the RK, uh, the RPK or RVKs would typically be on a, a crankshaft, but you're talking about an RA uh, value of about two. So it's gonna be really smooth. Um, but again, you gotta be careful about being too smooth because then there, it can't hold enough oil either. So uh, typically your crankshaft manufacturers are gonna have an idea of what they're targeting for, for journals. Uh, also your bearing guys, I would reach out and talk to the guys at the bearings and uh, bearing manufacturers and get an idea of what, what they would recommend uh, in terms of journal finish if you're doing some finishing your crankshaft yourself. Um, but I think that's the nice thing about it is, and again, we talk about like an RA of two, uh, on some of these parts, you know, but what does that look like? You definitely want an RA, uh, or say a surface finish that's got more valley than it's got peaks on a crank for certain, because you you want to support that load, maintain some oil retention if you can, but really, 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 you want to have as much load bearing area as possible. And that's kind of where, I mean, good question, actually, this is going to leave me something else. So besides just this, the, the profile and the numbers, it also has the Abbott Firestone curve as well, or your bearing area curve. And that's really, uh, to your crankshaft question, what you want is you don't want something that looks anything like this. You want that thing to be flat across. You don't want anything picking up, picking up, because that's what's gonna uh, impact the bearings and disrupt the oil film. You want it to be as flat as possible across there. And again, the, the bearing guys and the crankshaft guys are probably going to have more experience in measuring crankshafts uh, surface finish because literally I've never done it with this thing. I know you can do it, uh, but I've actually personally never done it. So I'll stop talking at this point. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to ask you one more question just because, again, we're going to respect everybody's time. Any questions that we still have left, uh, we will get those over to Lake. Lake is excellent at getting back to everybody. So Lake will make sure if there's anything left over here, we'll get those over to you. Um, so the question is, is can you tell me uh, what stylus travel length you use on the profilometer? Let me go see, let me look and see. I forget what we what, what we said, what the, the basic setting on this one is. Um, Uh-oh, stop, push the wrong button. <laughs> it's all good. All right, um, looks like the distance we're going across is uh, 300 thousandths of an inch. Is what we're, or, no, three thousandths, sorry, not right. 30 thousandths of an inch is the is what we've set up the, uh, the area to, to trace at um, on this particular device. which is the standard, it comes that way, out of the box. Okay, all right, excellent. Well, Lake, you know, we thank you very much for uh, for your presentation. I mean, just a great job. This is, I know the profilometer and we've covered this a little bit, but uh, in some of the other, you know, surface finish presentations that we do, and we can't emphasize more just how important this is is becoming. This having this tool in the shop, you know, is is just getting to be, it's, it's a must have tool. And like you said, you, you know, you really can't, uh, uh, you don't know what you don't know. Right. So. Um, yeah. And the thing about it, Rob, that hopefully you know, we actually had some really great technical questions here. The last few were, we really got specific, which is great. The thing I want everyone to know is if you're still watching at this point is this thing is super easy. It, it we don't have to overthink it. Yeah. I think that's the kind of the key message is that, this thing is very user friendly. It's very easy to use right out of the box. It gives you a lot of great information and you, it's, you don't have to overthink it, which is the great thing because uh, it gives you stuff to think about, gives you perspective, 
but you don't have to worry about getting too caught up in the details of, well, how fast did I travel to do this? Just pick your reference standard. And what comes out of it, the box is going to be good. It's going to take care of probably 95% of everything you've ever come across. Just the out of the box settings are going to give you what you need. And it gives you that reference point to move from. If you get into those 5% applications where you need something different, then this thing's got tools. Uh, again, back to the big giant book. You can find <laughs> nope. answers if you Lake, stay warm down there. Appreciate your time. And Thank uh, you, Rob. You too. You, you stay betcha. warm where you are too. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'll do right now is uh, we'll go over back over to Amanda and she'll just a couple more slides to wind things up. So thanks again, Lake. Thank you all. All right, we'll keep this real quick, you guys. We know everyone's ready to get on with their day. First off, um, we have all of our webinars on YouTube. So links will be up there before you know it, and all the previous webinars are out there. Please go out to our um, YouTube page, AERA Engine Builders is a great thing to search to find us. And uh, su subscribe so you don't miss any of our videos. And then lastly... Uh, please take a moment and fill out the survey when you leave today. Let us know how we're doing, if you have any additional questions for us or for Lake. And if you need to get a hold of anyone here at AERA, you can get a hold of us. You can see 815-526-7600 is our phone number. The tech email address is there, along with my email and Rob's. Or you can always reply to any of the emails you get uh, from GoToWebinar. Those come straight to me, and I'm happy to pass along anything that needs to go to anyone else. So thanks again, everybody. We appreciate you taking time out of your day and we hope you have a great afternoon.